The simpleton's joke here is substandard to what's actually going on. A lesser comedian would say, when you pick Mario, it's because you're someone's grandpa who's just playing the game with his grandkids. Or, you're not really much of a gamer and you wanted to pick someone that you recognized. That's not the truth in this day and age. The truth about Mario players is that they're lazy. Because they wanted to perform the absolute bare minimum of mental gymnastics needed to perform well in this game. You're like the kind of guy who goes to an ice cream store and sees about 30 unique interesting flavors but always pick something not too unlike vanilla because you live in perpetual fear that you won't like it and you'll regret your choice later. Here's someone who picks Ryu when you play Street Fighter and the irony is that Ryu from Street Fighter is in this game as well. You wanted a character you can play with the absolute minimum amount of brain power required possible because while there are simpler and more basic options on the roster, Mario is a character who takes all but five seconds to understand. If we look at simpler characters, when I want to give someone a heavy, I tell them to try King K. Rule. When I want them to put the lowest effort possible into elevating their gameplay to high-level tactics, I give them Lucina. But when I need to explain what Smash Brothers even is to my 71-year-old PTSD-ridden Vietnam vet grandpa, I tell him to pick Mario, start pressing buttons, and ignore the rustling in the trees outside because the war ended 48 years ago. Oh, you think you're funny? You think you're so fucking funny, don't you, Mr. Jokes? It's funny because he's a big dumb ape. It's funny because he makes funny faces. It's funny because he's big and slow and makes big old hits. <laughs> Donkey Kong is a joke character and anyone who tries to main him is doing it for the jokes no matter what they say. And I can't exactly blame you. With his big goofy moves and potentially insulting plays, he makes for a great stand-up comedy routine. But no one will ever take you seriously when playing DK, no matter how good you are, because he will forever remain the pocket pick for any player who who just wants to fuck around and evolve the game into shenanigans. Playing Link is like buying fireworks at Walmart and setting them off in your backyard. You think you're doing a lot and putting a whole lot of effort to make a big spectacle, but mostly you're just entertaining yourself because you know your other options, whether it be more efficient characters or that scruffy guy who sells borderline mortar shells out the back of his truck, will set you up for something better. You don't have enough projectile pressure to lock down a game, and you don't have enough combat options to intimidate someone in a brawl. All you have is your own little game of solitaire, which is eventually going to make your opponent say, God damn it, can you just play the game right for once? Which is a fairly nonsensical sentence when you think about it, since there's no real wrong way to play Smash Brothers, but you're putting that question in their head regardless. Anyone who fights against Link treats him the same way the internet treats him in his Gerudo outfit. One unfortunate slip up, and I'm going to fuck him so hard. Stop rolling, you fucking coward! Did you know the A button exists on your controller? Most likely you don't, because each and every frame of the game needs to be filled with a special move in your eyes, because special moves on Samus means projectiles, and with your logic, which I'm quoting verbatim here, is how could I possibly lose if I just spam projectiles? There is never a Samus player who doesn't lust for power in the back of their one-note strategy lizard brains. Even the most casual of Samus players get a bit salty when they lose, because all they really give a shit about is winning and making sure you don't even get to play the game. If whoever you're playing against locks and Samus, just turn the game off and ask if they'd rather fuck you in the ass instead, because giving them a more efficient route to piss you off and hold dominance over you is the one thing they want out of this pitifully short life we have here on Earth. Aside from tax evasion jokes, there's a long-running association of sexual deviancy with Yoshi. He's got funny smelling eggs, big goofy foot shoes, and explicitly shows everyone his asshole during Mario Party. As a tried and true Yoshi main in most Mario spinoffs since 1996, Seven, maybe that says a lot about me. But he's not who I main in Smash Brothers. That's coming up later. What that says about Yoshi players, however, is that they undoubtedly have a fetish for sugar and caffeine. I want to proudly introduce you to the most hyperactive member of your playgroup. No Yoshi player can resist the allure of using their goofy body to bounce around bounce house style and fly across the map like a slingshot fired out of a catapult. Each and every second of a Yoshi player's game is filled with action, even if absolutely nothing is happening. Happening. When they're not busy whiffing attacks from halfway across the screen, they'll bounce in their seat, tap buttons on the controller loud enough to echo in a library,
Fury and try to do the worst thing that any Smash player could ever do. Talk to you and ask you questions mid-match. What a Yoshi player needs to learn is maybe you don't need to mash the attack button for every single frame of the game. You would think pressing the A button 60 times a second would be a daunting task, but for the average Yoshi player whose breakfast consists of nothing but pixie sticks, cocaine, and vitamin B12, this is slow rolling. It's been 24 long years and you still haven't evolved out of the tactic of flying above the action and spamming down B most of the match. You're also the least likely to know how to even play the game. Half because Kirby hasn't been a good character in 22 of the last 24 years, and because Kirby players only ever choose him because they like Kirby. Despite his squiggly marshmallow demeanor and appearance, Kirby isn't actually that fun to play. Any of you watching out there who just got defensive know you only disagree with me because you want to defend Kirby. Because you like Kirby. Not Kirby as a character in Smash Brothers. See, it's this vicious feedback loop. Kirby is a little adorable man, but boy is he a big old bag of nothing in the game. And the fanboys and girls are gonna come out of the woodwork and call me super duper mean for saying that about him. But I'll bet their defense has nothing to do with how many tournaments they've won, or the fact that they don't ever use the throw button in the game because they always forget which button it is. <laughs> If only the Star Fox game series got the same treatment this golden child did. Props to Smash Brothers Melee Fox for being the leading video game character and in inspiring gamers to protest bathing, because you just gotta keep grinding out those sets. Fox in a lot of ways is the defining face of Super Smash Brothers. His function in the game is barely even cognizant of the games he came from, but his toolkit makes him the perfect character to slowly crush the game into a singularity. The vast majority of Fox players are terrible, because they choose Fox with the initial mindset of wanting a competitive edge, and very, very few of them ever utilize it. For every extremely skilled and top percentage Fox player winning tournaments, there are countable thousands who cast the K9 into crunch time because they think, well, Fox is good and therefore playing him makes me good too. <laughs> it doesn't. If you're a pro Smash Brothers player watching this video, and of course you are, everyone of high class and skill watches all of my videos, keep picking Fox because you're utilizing him in ways worth your salt. But for the rest of you who are picking the golden fur fuck boy with the intention of an easy win, let me just say this as a longtime Star Fox fan. Can you at least care about the character character and not just the win percentages long enough to help us get a good Star Fox game for the first time in 26 years? You're either someone's younger sibling or the most unlikable tryhard fuck in the entire room. Pikachu sits on a precious perch of strongly appealing to lesser experienced players, but still earning the cautious ire of whoever you might be playing with that has experience with the game. If you do really well with Pikachu and aren't the type to maliciously tattoo frame data on your scrotum, expect the rest of the room to assume you're much better than you're letting on. Oh, and choosing Pikachu just because you really like Pokemon is a paper-thin excuse. Whether you're a fan of the Pokemon series trying out Smash for the first time or someone who knows more facts about Smash Brothers than your first cousins, a Pikachu player is always going to make everyone antsy. In the golden days of yore, Luigi would be referred to as second banana to Mario. People's conception of him was that we were witnessing the anti-Mario wrapped in the same shell. Although Luigi maintained the physical ability and back story of his brother, he was cowardly, clumsy, and all the less heroic. This is not even remotely the case anymore. Luigi by this point may as well be from another fucking planet. The only reason this guy has any inkling of attachment to Mario in modern times is through grandfathering in. Luigi over the years has morphed into an awkward, whack-ass doppelganger who feels like an entirely different entity, and I think Luigi players are completely aware of that. While some people play Luigi on a whim, he's mostly a character of deliberate intentions. The internal monologue of a Luigi player may as well be a never-ending loop of circus music and Saturday morning cartoon intros, because as soon as that loading screen goes away, it's time to do the same thing that Max Goof's mom did, and get real fucking goofy. You will never meet a more random player in your life. Attacks will be thrown out because, I don't know, whatever. And even the most calculated of plays will have a few people asking, what the fuck was that? A moderately skilled Luigi player and a random number generator firing off inputs will look exactly the same. Little baby boy Ness is often a character of ifs. 
Oh, if I hit this recovery angle just right, this is going to be a huge play. Oh, hey, if I perfectly time my bat smash attack, the reflected projectile is going to KO my opponent. Oh, hey, if, if I had a date Friday night, I wouldn't be playing this stupid fucking game every weekend. But in truth, those ifs are often only just that. You can giggle like a spring chicken all you want when that precious adrenaline begins coursing through your system after you got that perfectly playbook knockout, but we all know that that was from your 11th try doing the exact same same thing. And the third and seventh tries cost you a match. So why don't you settle down a little bit? Why don't you? You are so fucking cool. There is no joke. There is no meme. This is not leading up to anything. You are absolutely 100% a cool motherfucker. There is never a bad time to pick Captain Falcon. There is never any reason to hate on Captain Falcon. And there is never ever a lack of fun in a game with a Captain Falcon in it. Everyone loves you, both in game and in real life, and you should use this video and its incoming corroborating comments section as evidence that being Captain Falcon is something you should boast about until the end of time. It doesn't matter if you're trying hard to win or just trying to make the most memorable plays of the night. You make the game better, and we're glad you're playing it. If you disagree, go ahead and try to hate on Captain Falcon. See how far that gets you. Oh, you can be the nicest guy in the world. You can play the friendliest game of Smash Brothers imaginable, and you can even be bad at the game and make for an easy target. But the instant you lock in Jigglypuff, everyone in the room hates playing with you, and there is nothing you can do about it. Now, you can say that about a handful of characters, but with Jigglypuff, it's an objective fact and not a matter of personal taste. Even Jigglypuff defenders whisper a bit of, oh boy, here we go, when they sit next to someone rocking the roly-poly way Wave maker. You can enjoy running jigs all you want, but just make sure to offer to pay for the group pizza so you actually get invited back to game night next time. You float around, you throw some turnips. 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 Peach and Daisy aren't just good for floating up the leaderboards on the Rule 34 websites. They're also good for floating around, throwing some turnips, and seemingly rewriting the game for their own pleasure. Pun absolutely intended. If you're a peach slash daisy whore, be sure to stop being humble about how oh, they're not as good as you think they are. You're playing a character that in many ways has you rewriting the fundamentals of movement in the game. And also you can slam opponents with a mouthful of vegetables and their face full of your ass. And it works. Peach and daisy work. It fucking works because they work it. You know that when you suffer your six broken finger after a few years of playing these two, you have no one to blame but yourself. And now that has nothing to do with Smash Brothers. You've just got to stop browsing that pornography, man. There's a very, very, very good chance here you have no fucking idea what you're talking about or doing. Bowser is the king's classic choice of this guy looks tough, so he's got to be good. Ask anyone who's ever even meditated on the Smash roster for all of five minutes, and they'll let you know with resounding thunder and fury that Bowser fucking sucks. So why do you play this guy? I can give you a pass if you want to intentionally challenge yourself, or you just really like the character, but if you perform some force dimensional arithmetic and explaining that his down B butt smash is giving you a boner because it's just so funny, then do me a favor and get the fuck out of my Chuck E. Cheese because Timmy behind you already called next. Hey, fuck you. Yeah, yeah, fuck you, fuck you. You know exactly what you're doing. No one picks Ice Climbers to enjoy a rousing game of Smash Brothers with these frigid friends. Everyone who picks Ice Climbers does it to be annoying, and there's like 400 ways they can do it. There's mountains of glitches, peak spammability, and frigid excitement levels of fight hype. Now, frigid as an adjective is not very good, by the way. You're picking a gimmick from the get-go, and most of the time that gimmick has either been nerfed or banned outright. So what are you even doing here by this point? Ice Climbers is a stellar pick if you want to subtly give everyone an excuse to pause the game and take a lunch break. But in terms of trying to make anything interesting happen this match, you really just fucked up. Oh, oh, fuck, fuck. Shit, 
Shit, shit. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Sheik, I, I was just playing a different video game on my Nintendo Switch because you just started your first combo. I, I would really like to get out of here before midnight so I can reliably claim I didn't spend all night dicking around playing video games, but your insistency to play Sheik has all but ruined that for me. No, 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 please, please, take your time. Just let me know when you're done circle jerking in your own octagon of never-ending feather tickle combos because I'm just gonna sit here and wonder what hobby you enjoy more, calculating your taxes or speed Rubik's Cube solving. Oh, wait, hang on. Hey, yeah, I did. I, I, I wasn't sure if I got there, but I did. I just finished my save file on the Binding of Isaac and it only took 130 hours. Should I start another? Well, I, I mean, I have time. You've only taken one of my lives. Yeah, I'm gonna start again. Oh boy, I can't believe it. Someone who actually wants to play Zelda and not Sheik? Well, this is really exciting. <laughs> I can't wait to, <laughs> where are you going? Why are you, why are you just running to the other end of the stage? Okay, so you threw a projectile. Go ahead and dodge that. Okay, you're doing another one. Setting up some, that's kind of annoying. Okay, boom, I, I, got, I got in and I hit you. So now I'm gonna like shield or dodge or, nope. Oh, you're just gonna, you're just gonna run to the other side of the stage. Hey, yep, yep, there's a projectile. There it goes. Okay, um, well, you let me know when you're not gonna play like a little bitch and I'll pick up the controller again. How about that? Edgy Mario. Who asked for Edgy Mario? Who takes real pride in playing Dr. Mario? Who sits down at a lovely dinner conversation and says, listen, I know you must be soaking that chair inside and out from how arousing you find my incredible gamer physique, but I just thought I'd sweeten the deal by telling you that I'm a Dr. Mario main. Oh, I know. Your place or mine. And bring your sister. Dr. Mario is a function and nothing more. He exists because Nintendo wanted to pull the Jackie Chan Fists of Fire nuclear roster option, but Sakurai begged and pleaded them to not fill out the slots with nine different Mario clones, so they settled on three. Except now, Luigi has metastasized into his own man, while Dr. Mario's best gimmick is studying archival films of Mario stubbing his toe and adopting that demeanor as his entire personality. Pichu is a joke character, but in the opposite direction. There's no festivity to winning with Pichu, Pichu like there used to be. The idea of, whoa, he beat you with Pichu, went out with the GameCube. And now the fact he actually reigned a bit as a top tier character cements his status as the poor man's humiliation maker. If you play Pichu to Pichu, that's fine. There's not much to say other than what I already said for Pikachu, just turn the dial up on everything a little bit. But if you play this adorable mousy fuck for even a split second, thinking winning with him gives you some street cred, then it's time to get out of your time capsule, Grant. Grandpa, because I'm proud to announce that we finally created a vaccine for polio. Hands off my cock! That's the war cry of any Falco main. But they're not shouting it at other Smash Brothers enthusiasts. They're blasting it as their internal monologue thanks to their non-stop turbocharged V8 ego. Falco as a character has very little to talk about, having been a clone of the most successful Smash character ever created. But instead, the story here is the lore around this blue bastard that's about 10 miles deep. If you want a true second banana story, you can ignore Mario's green brother and instead turn to Falco. There's there's a strong cult around Falco that's formed in the Smash scene, and try as they might to claim that they're the absolute shit and Falco's hot tits in every game that he's in, they can't escape the image built around our avian friend. Falco will always falter behind Fox in every aspect, and I think Falco players will always falter behind Fox players in every aspect. It doesn't matter that Falco was technically tier listed higher in Smash Brothers Brawl, the worst Smash Brothers game, because a Falco player has a toggle switch in their brain. They're either an unrespected powerhouse who has all the tools to push past Fox if someone were to crack the code, or Falco's just not as good as he seems and they deserve a standing ovation for playing a nerfed version of the best character ever on purpose. Neither of these opinions really matter, because for a Falco player, all that matters is that they play Falco, and you and everyone you know is going to know this fact, because they won't ever stop talking about it. A Marth player's strategy 
is exactly the same as his success in dating, the only expendable income he'll ever have, and the visible piece of their delusions of grandeur iceberg. Just the tip. Well, you want to win, don't you? And you want to do it easily, don't you? Boy, do I have the most milk toast character imaginable for you. The largest crowd uproar a Lucina player can ever hope for is a few people muttering, Ooh, mm, yeah, okay. Yeah. After they win a match. Lucina is super good at what she does, but what she does is play the most formulatic game of Smash Brothers ever imaginable. If you just so happen to be in the niche category of playing Lucina because you loved Fire Emblem Awakening, well, why don't you go fuck yourself anyway? Because you're partially responsible for Fire Emblem going from a respectable tactics RPG to the cringiest anime fan service snooze fest of the last decade. Do you dream of doing all the work required of playing Link except at three times the speed? Do you like mod Mocking the lactose intolerant. Do you want your opponent to physically smack you in the mouth in real life at some point during the match? Then I have the perfect character for you. But at least at the end of every match, you can say, hey, at least I'm not playing Toon Link. Even the Smash announcer doesn't like Ganondorf. Bowser! Mario! Ganondorf! That's how tiresome he is. Ganondorf walks such an incredible tightrope of actual skill requirement and new player trap, it's amazing he hasn't joined the, oh, ironically good circus yet. Let's look at the facts. Ganondorf has ranked in the absolute last possible tier in every single Smash game, except for Melee, which is only because he's the most like Captain Falcon in that game who I covered earlier. The main difference in Ganondorf is he's an absolutely garbage character, and at no point in history has he ever been remotely close to Captain Falcon in terms of excitement, viability, or fun factor, thanks to being a contrived hype machine. Ganondorf himself is not interesting. It's the fanboys who scream, oh my god, he's playing Ganondorf! I can't believe it, Ganondorf sucks ass! That's what makes the character interesting, and it's just a cliche underdog story. The only place that Ganondorf works, embarrassingly enough, is in the role-playing sphere. On the absolute surface level, you have the higher skilled players using Ganondorf as a handicap, or the determined grinders who want to excel with a character who plays the absolute most most bare bone game of Smash possible. Then you have the people who play Ganondorf to play the dwarf. They just want a wizard foot dick holes across the map, catch someone off guard with a fat warlock punch, and butt fuck someone as the true prince of darkness. Ganondorf is a casual's choice, and for good reason. Typically, these are players who aren't very good and will get their ass kicked time and time again against higher skilled players while leaving every match muttering, oh, if I had just gotten that one good hit, I would have turned this whole thing around, without realizing the entire reason they always lose is because they never will get that one good hit, except on the odd chance that a slot machine would give the same odds to on hitting a jackpot. But with all this, Ganondorf himself has no interesting gimmicks and no moves that aren't either boring or what already make Captain Falcon better. So for people like me who think the hype around Ganondorf is unsupported and overrated, what objective value does he provide? A test of skill at best, a character based off someone's racist grandfather at worst, and the majority of the time, a slower, clunkier version of a potentially five-star character pick. Okay, this one's gonna be a bit more personal. I, I brought up the chair because it's story time. Forget all the Major League stat crunching and analysis for a second. When I was eight years old, Super Smash Bros. 64 had just hit store shelves, and I put my hours in, oh, you better believe it. I ran through the campaign countless times, played against my friends in multiplayer, and had no fucking idea who Ness was. You know, everything you would expect. I was also a giant Pokemon fan at the time. Well, I still am, but I just think modern Pokemon is hot garbage, but that's another point. My main was Pikachu, and my world-class, unstoppable tactic was flying through the air and spamming down B to hit people with random thunder attacks. And then one day I was hanging out with my older brother, who decided to take me to his friend's house. My eyes bulged out of their skulls like a fucking Looney Tune when I noticed that they were playing Super Smash Brothers on the GameCube. Now, I didn't even know there was a Smash Brothers sequel coming out, and here it was, rip roaring, ready to go with all the characters unlocked and everything. So my brother and I grabbed some controllers and we set up a standard two minute four player game, as was the style at the time, and I scrolled through the character list, and I saw him. Mew mother fucking two. 
the most powerful Pokemon. The one who wrecked Ash's asshole inside and out in Pokemon the first movie. The Pokemon who blew telekinesis out his butthole at anyone who dared to stand in his way. The legendary bitch slapper who trained for 10,000 years in a cave just waiting for me to beat the Elite Four before it even considered moving the guy with the British hat guarding the entrance out of the way. I immediately locked in Mewtwo with a strong glimmer of childlike wonder in my eyes. And I remember this really clearly. Vi super vividly. Shockingly. The game loaded. And the stage was Jungle Japes. I even remember that part. And as soon as the match started, I got my ass beat. I got the shit stomped out of me inside and out. And then force fed to me. Then I would have a second load of shit that I'd be force fed later on, like six, eight hours later. I didn't get a single kill. I barely did any damage. And if I had properly gone through puberty at the time, I'm certain my testicles would have receded back into my body cavity, never to be seen again. Now, 10 year old me at the time had tons of protests saying things like, oh, the new game is too fast, or I don't have a GameCube. I don't know how to use this controller, but none of that mattered. Mewtwo let me down. That's one of the most vivid memories I have of Smash Brothers Melee. And I think it's permanently tainted my perspective of Mewtwo and Smash. Because all I can ever think, ever, when I see him in the game, is this one fact. Why is the most powerful psychic Pokemon to ever live spending all match floating around like a plastic bag on the highway and whipping his tail around like he's hoping Incineroar is gonna dick him down? I hope you like ramen, cause you're getting a shitload of noodle hits with this boy. Okay, that's a competitive joke, so I'm just gonna... We're gonna tone it down a little bit. Roy exists on a binary spectrum. When you see this boy's bloodlusted fire crotch launching itself at you at 90 miles an hour, you're either gonna witness one of two things. The first is an absolute momentum-based smackdown of epic proportions. You'll see combos, juggles, bitch slaps from a stub sword faster than you can blink. There's a certain zone that Roy is gonna enter, a flow state delivered from the fighting game gods on high that will make matches seem effortless and other characters feel like they move through jello. If you hit this state, feel free to sign up for the U.S. Armed Forces, because the only way you're going to recreate this combat high is through actual armed warfare. But the second, the second is the opposite of that. Roy's most prominent characteristic here in a match can also be perfectly represented by a swimming pool of mashed potatoes. His doughy, worthless exterior will fail to find anything that works as he gets a colonoscopy straight from the enemy's foot. Combos will whiff, attacks will bounce off. Like wearing a condom, things just won't feel as good. If you're a fan of high highs and low lows, Roy is the character for you. And if you're picking him because he's super handsome, he's 15, you sick fuck. Roy, but baller. Something about Krom just goes harder in every way. Maybe it's his more all or nothing mechanics and recovery or his more cromulent appearance. But where Roy players are likely to punch a bully in the face for talking shit about their mom, Krom players just ignore the tormenting and long con the bully's sister into trying anal with them for the first time. The average Krom player has some sort of tough guy hobby to go with their gameplay. Maybe they lift weights. Maybe they rock climb. Maybe they try to set speedrun records with their pit bull's ability to maul a Toddler. But a Krom player is never, ever someone to fuck with because their victory quote from any major tournament is going to be, I'd fucking kill you in real life if I could. Speaking about Game & Watch is pointless because there isn't a single person alive who gives a shit about the character outside of Smash. If you look me in the eye and tell me you have true nostalgia for Game & Watch consoles from 1980 while also having some sort of investment in Super Smash Brothers, then I'm calling the Guinness Book of World Records because we have a new contender for the world's oldest living human being. As much as I like to toe the line of talking shit on a featureless black blob from a long forgotten console line, I'd rather let the ultimate Game & Watch player themselves represent their species. Guys. I've invited a girl here to play Smash later on. She is cute, and I think I could be able to lose my virginity, but I want to make her think I am charming. I made this list of puns, uh, still working on it, and one-liners for every Game & Watch move because he is my main. I will say them when I do moves and hopefully make her laugh. I have also listed lines for when the room is tense that won't annoy her and ones for when it becomes a flirty atmosphere so I can progress to having sex with her. Can you read through and see what you think? Will the flirty lines work? Go ahead and pause the video now if you want a glimpse of the king of the Game & Watch fandom. Sucks to suck, doesn't it? Abandoned ship, women and Smash players first. At least the boat's egress proceedings can count as a much needed bath from the ocean, because Meta Knight isn't anything anymore. If you're uneducated, Meta Knight reached the fabled double S tier in Smash Brothers Brawl, because just like 
like a wrestler's bleeding face, he was busted wide open. I legitimately do not have enough time in this video to list what made Meta Knight such a kooky bananas man in the third Nintendo kerfuffle game. But in seceding games, he sits in a dumpy little mid spot. And because Meta Knight fans are such a rare breed, he has dropped down to one of the bottom 10 most used characters by ranked online players. Uh, but, 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 but can we humble Meta Knight defenders at least take pride in our pick? You cry between braced teeth and dried anxiety throats? No, because while the idea of Kirby's Shadow the Hedgehog seems good on paper, Kirby as a series is too initially cutesy for me to not find this man adorable. Ah, sure, yeah, by Act 3, Kirby games usually push the puree setting on the Nightmare Fuel Blender, but the reputation for the franchise is not gonna go away. And the only intimidation I feel when I see Meta Knight and his stubby little sword is that I'll get scolded for pinching his chubby little cheeks a bit too much. Oh, oh, oh come here. Oh, 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 oh. Ah, the perfect character for someone with a lot of time on their hands. If you're looking for a second job, Pit and Dark Pit are right up your alley. You're gazing upon the ship and the bottle of fighters, the house of cards of characters, and the sand mandala of selections. Playing Pit offers a career with no room to expand and no stock options. You will put in the work and feel no satisfaction. You will feel zero intrinsic attachment to defend him on why you think he's fun to play. And you certainly won't have anyone in your corner if people are choosing a neutral party to root for. Pit's inclusion and subsequent lazy palette swap for Dark Pit is warranted to some extent, I suppose, better than some other inclusions on this list, but if he was removed from this game, absolutely no one would care. The most likely reason Pit and his cronies are in Smash is because Sakurai worked directly on Kid Icarus Uprising. Fun fact about that game, it underperformed in sales compared to the original Kid Icarus from 1986 and the entire Kid Icarus franchise has only sold about 3 million units combined in the last 35 years. So if you're one of the nine people who cares at all that Kid Icarus is in Smash, congratulations, you stole a few slots from the biggest crossover event in video game history because Sakurai had to slip his ego pet project in there. Pit sucks ass and I'm tired of talking about him. But he's not the worst thing to come from Kid Icarus in this game. Oh, and we'll get there. Bo -bo 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 boobs boobs and titties and butts you can see a lot of her body and her ass is hanging out and stuff she feels like she's wearing nothing at all which is ironic because the play style of this chick is everything everywhere all at once when you play against zero suit samus you're no longer playing smash you're playing tag they'll gymnast flip booty shake all over the screen changing directions faster than a hummingbird loose in the pepsi cola factory the irony of all of this is that the majority of zero suit samus players don't emulate her appearance at all and instead look like they themselves got lost in the Pepsi Cola factory. But at least ZSS doesn't tend to lend herself to as much waifuing as the other princesses do. I'll give you credit to the fact that a zero suit main is more likely to stare me down in the shower and say, yeah, I masturbate to my main, what of it? Instead of shyly tiptoeing around the subject while paying a seminal tribute to the avatar of your choice. Just be careful when shaking hands after a good match because... I mean, look at her, dude. How is this allowed in a Nintendo game? An atomic clock is said to be so accurate at keeping time that they're only off by about one second every 100 million years. They achieve this accuracy by measuring the natural oscillation in photons and have countless applications in scientific developments. Every so often, we add a leap second to our leap years because the Earth's orbit is not a perfect 365 days, and atomic clocks give us the idea of what time we should actually be trying to keep. If you were to think that playing Wario is an ironic statement for even a single second of time as measured by an atomic clock, then you need to readjust your watch because you've traveled back to 2002. Wario isn't a mysterious cloaked figure of, look at this fucking goober in my Nintendo game anymore. This dude has had at least 17 games of his own since his first appearance in Super Mario Land 2. And who knows how many cameos and spin-offs and other things. Wario's presence in a Mario property these days isn't interesting at all. It just kind of is. Sure, there's the odd occasion he's left out, but leave it to Waluigi to pick up the mantle of obsessive fanboy demand, because that dude is a literal coin toss in the realm of does Nintendo and don't give a shit about this character. Find out next time. So all you're left with is picking someone off of design. And fart jokes, motorcycles, and garlic are all definitely awesome, so I do have to tip my invisible hat to you a little bit. Just don't let your ego go to your head when you pick this chunkster. There's way too many people throwing themselves
themselves pride parades for their demographic of I play video games as a pant shitting gremlin. Give me a trophy. Stop it. You're not special anymore. Let's ignore the gameplay fundamentals of Snake for a minute here, because we need to talk about why playing Snake is a true patrician's choice. In a video game featuring superheroes, evil monsters, hyper-athletes, animal creatures, and nostalgic fan service, your choice of character to represent you as a man with some guns and a nice ass. Snake's kit for actual gameplay has the potential to be an annoying keep-away and zoning artist, but that potential is equally viable for going going full on calculus on your opponent's ass. Fact, a sizable percentage of the most creative, exciting, and unexpected setups in Smash have come from snake players. And a good snake main makes the game fun by making their opponents feel like they fucked up real bad for walking into a trap that was actually completely unavoidable as crafted by you, you scrumptious little villain. It's really hard for me to roast Snake because I think he gets a bad rap from too many players using his skill set to play a pussified footsie game when he really excels at dropping a plot twist at the end of every combo and that twist is yeah my c4 was there the whole time say goodbye to your stock dumbass hell i'm gonna give you guys a full disclaimer on this one i only own two amiibos snake and midna well why why midna because look at the ass on this thing oh my god I've been a snake main since Brawl, and I really didn't like Smash Brothers Brawl, but I would have been a snake main anywhere he showed up, because I've been a snake main since Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation 1. Let's just leave it at this. The majority of you snakes out there gotta stop being such wimps and going for war of attrition unwatchable bullshit. Go for some sandwich maneuvers, force your opponent to recover into a charged up forward smash, and use the fucking forward air. Yes, it's a slow clunky axe kick but the spikes off of it will put hair on your chest and semen in your pants especially if you're a woman for all you dumb haters go easy on snake it's not his fault it's the players. And when more people embrace the aggressive snake style that most 70s kung fu movies would love for you to do, he's gonna be a much more exciting character to watch. Hate the player, not the game. Oh, you fuck your wife, don't you? Or you wanna fuck Ike, don't you? Ike is a character who exudes power, and each and every Ike player picks him because there's something about this more effeminate guts from Berserk and imagining yourself in his shoes. Swinging a big fucking slab of a blade around and ever hitting a forward smash is just a pure dopamine spike. Most Ike players are just going for that one single moment of the game where their opponent flies away at Mach 5 and they go, oh. After that, they're set for the rest of the night. Just try not to do any algebra anytime soon if you main Ike. Your brain can't handle it. Gee, Mom, how come this guy gets three characters to pick from? Pokemon Trainer is such a weird microcosm of fan service colliding with not wanting the roster to be too cluttered by the biggest franchise of all time. Charizard's here because he's fucking Charizard. In Smash 4, he was the only member of the Pokemon Trainer gang who returned, and his popularity and fat paper stack to the ceiling support this endeavor as a big move. And once you rattle down Ivysaur's shoo-in conclusion thanks to that weird subsect of people that want to marry an Ivysaur, Squirt then fills out the roster of each evolution stage of the original starters. Isn't it pretty silly how every Pokemon trainer player always has one they latch onto though, instead of a nice evenly distributed ratio of 33% for each Pokemon? It tends to become an 80% favor towards the one they prefer and then some dabbling with the other two. In their introduction, Pokemon switching mattered in Smash Brothers Brawl because Pokemon would become fatigued and perform worse the longer they were out in the action. But now, that's gone. So your dumb little half revolver gimmick really only exists for two reasons. Number one, Smash Ultimate was said to be bringing back every character, and that includes the ones that weren't designed with this less gimmicky game in mind, and Pokemon Trainer is part of this package. And two, probably more importantly, if Pokemon Trainer wasn't a complete package, Squirtle and Ivysaur would not be in this game. So while I know a ton of you Pokemon Trainer mains out there love doodling around with your Squirtle and writing your vows for your Ivysaur, you better bend yourself over backwards and thank the most overused, overhated Pokemon of all time for carrying your favorite sorry ass into this part of a balanced breakfast. Is it possible to be simultaneously super annoying and super charismatic at the same time? Well, of course it is. Just look at my YouTube channel. 
Every piece of this primate from top to bottom was made to get on your nerves. Playstyles need not apply. Regardless of skill, tactics, rule set, or environment, Diddy Kong will create a game with a 100% money back guarantee if you don't say the phrase FUCKING STOP at least once. And yet you cannot hate him. You can't. Maybe it's because he's silly funny monkey, or maybe this whole thing loops back around to being comically depressing in its level of frustration, but it's most likely the fact that he was made to be obnoxious, which somehow makes him less obnoxious than other characters that just turn out to be obnoxious. If Donkey Kong is the apex predator of the joke character world, then Diddy Kong is the alpha male of the troll department. And the sooner you recognize that title, the quicker you'll stop getting mad at him, which is very important because Smash players are sharks. They have to eat each other in the womb to survive and have 15 rows of teeth. But they're also like sharks because if they smell blood in the water, they're going to capitalize on it. If someone finds out you've got a real fist clencher attitude towards jetpacking jungle japers, then a chant of ya kane get ready the ditty is gonna echo into your set and you'll soon be tussling with this tumbling tree topper. Accept the goofs or die laughing. I love this guy and you should too if you know what's good for you. Sumimasen. Honto wa miwaku ke kaku takunai no desuka Konokawa maigo ni nate iru to omoi wa watashi wa kare no ryoshin o mitsukeru koto ga dekimasen. Kore ga anata no musu ko de aru bai wa herupu desuku de kare ni ate kudesai. Go kyo ryoku arigato gozaimasu. Tails bench. Sally Acorn love doll with real bones. Babysitting cream. Ugly movie Sonic. Top 10 hottest female Sonic characters. Chris Chan. Cold Steel the Hedgehog. Typing your name into Google and adding the hedgehog after it. Sonic shipping YouTube tributes. Sonic Boys sexy competition. Sonic funerals. Sonic EXE. Any channel like S Comics Play. Obvious self-reflecting parodies like Sonic Hedgehog and Sonic Dreams Collection. And the fact you know everything I just said is only the tip of the iceberg. You are playing Sonic. The internet has done my job for me. You're a Donkey Kong player without any balls. You wanted a bag of goofy tricks to make people laugh, but had to settle for something comfortably safe and much easier to fix when you fuck up. Oh, go ahead and crouch after every stock. God knows you needed a fourth taunt since that's one of your primary skills. Yes, it's always funny. And yes, I already know that you're thinking, well, the fact it makes you upset definitely means it's funny. But I already knew you would think that. So now you're just stuck thinking you're winning a linear irony loop argument when really I'm just watching a remarkably dumb dog chase its tail in a circle. Except the dog here is a king penguin. And the only thing you're the king of is getting an audible groan from the audience as soon as the announcer finishes saying King DDD. Ah, playing a, playing a real-time strategy game in a fighting game, that's a bold move. But you, you can go ahead and remove the strategy from RTS because you'll be spamming smash attacks nine times out of ten. You, you know what, in fact, go ahead and remove time from that as well because you're not going to give yourself even a second to think on your gameplay because you're just going to be pulling up Pikmin to full power and then spamming smash attacks. It, you really, you know what, let's just go ahead and remove real from your lexicon as well because your modus operandi every game isn't going to evolve a single tactic beyond drawing Pikmin, throwing the Pikmin in neutral play, and then spamming smash attacks. Boy, you fuck dogs, huh? No, 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 I'm kidding. You wanna fuck this dog. But let's divert from the obvious fan base jest and look at the gameplay. It's all about comeback mechanics. And not, no, not the kind you're thinking with Lucario, let's just move on. It just means you're a coward. A lot of people defend Lucario and slather him up and down in praise over how enjoyable it is to flip him getting his ass turned inside out into an ass beating. But think about that mechanically for just a second. You only need a comeback mechanic because your ass was getting beaten in the first place, which means you were never secure in your gameplay to begin with. Lucario is the character for everyone who needs a safety net. Those who don't want to win too hard because they're afraid of upsetting other people, and anyone who wants to at least feel some level of accomplishment even when getting absolutely stomped left and right. The amount of overlap that that has with all the people who want to fuck this guy is astounding. Oh, there's a stench of villainy in the air. When you see a Rob player, you have a pretty good guess as to who's the most likely person in the 
room to lock someone in their basement just for fun. Rob players are some truly sick fucks. Their tenacity to win at all times is keeping this one time only, nearly long forgotten, barely functional gimmick device on life support. You just know a Rob player is the type to scream internally when they lose and to let the tears flow on the drive home as they rant to themselves while slamming the fuck out of their steering wheel about how they should have won and how everyone else that played is a total fucking talentless hack. Don't bother becoming friends with a Rob player, because they're going to stay true to their naturally named instincts. And at the first instance of visiting your home, they're going to ransack your bedroom for DNA samples to aid them in their upcoming white collar crime spree. Rob may be an unsuccessful launch idea, but a Rob player's idea of a perfect world of Smash Brothers is when everyone is playing Rob, and the punishment for losing a match is public execution. Grip your children tightly around these no good doers. Have you no respect? Why would you pick this character that spits in the mouth of one of the driving forces behind Nintendo? Shigeru Miyamoto, creator of Legend of Zelda, an old Japanese person, famously cringed when he saw Toon Link's initial design and really didn't like him very much at all. That's real, you can look that up. Now don't get it twisted. You are here to spit in people's mouths because no one plays Toon Link for the sake of playing Toon Link. Toon Link is a deep, deep nostalgia cut for the vast majority of his users. People who want to play good Link play young Link. And anyone who doesn't care about performance just plays regular Link because, oh my god, have you seen how fucking hot he is? All that leaves is the mysterious nebula of Toon Link's camp, where everyone always needs justification or two for their choice in their back pocket. The first response to anyone's claim that they mean Toon Link is always a resounding, why? Maybe you liked Wind Waker and all the other cel-shaded Zelda shenanigans. Maybe Brawl's your favorite Smash Brothers for some stupid reason. Or maybe you started playing Toon Link when you were seven and just never stopped. It doesn't matter. Because for all of your days, you're gonna have to explain this one, Chief. Can't wait to see Pixel Link and Franco America Legend of Zelda Pasta with Meatballs and Tomato Sauce Link in the next Smash game. Take everything I said about Lucario, except instead of wanting comeback mechanics, you just want to jump on the Fox bandwagon without explicitly jumping on the fox bandwagon. And instead of fucking dogs, you want to get fucked by a dog. Here you go. Here's your Animal Crossing rep. Yep. It's pretty, pretty cool, right? Villager lazily drifts into the Smash Brothers scene with a resounding yawn. While conceptually he's a really good idea to represent the series and its exponentially exploding popularity, he's also just, the least exciting thing I've ever seen? Your character is a guy. Your abilities are a cavalcade of apple cinnamon farm and sim shit. Your moves are just like the worst of the worst from projectile spam to camping tactics to safe disjointed hitboxes. You're playing a rare breed of character that spawns nothing but disdain but no anger. No one hates Villager, but instead it's all just a sigh of disappointment in reserve whenever they see the character selection screen hover over him. I mean, I'd write more, but why bother? It's just boring from start to finish. When life gives you lemons, you ask, what the fuck am I supposed to do with these? Because this super fighting robot is gonna have you continually guessing your gameplay for years to come. Even the most seasoned, veteran, hardline Mega Man players have no fucking idea what they're doing with him. Combos just kind of fly out. Incredible plays are willed into existence by the sheer force of God. And each and every, oh, I meant to do that, has a 75% chance of being total bullshit. And this is because Mega Man's moveset was designed by Capcom themselves. It's a little known fact, but it's true. They just followed their own design document for Mega Man. The last full launch Mega Man game, which does not include legacy collections, spin-offs, or any of that, was released in 2018. And before that, the most recent Mega Man game was from all the way back in 2010, meaning that Mega Man did not have a game in four years when he was included in Smash 4 in 2014, and then went another four years without a game after that point, beating Smash Ultimate to market with Mega Man 11 by only two months. Mega Man went through an eight year hiatus with nothing of value to his name. It took a combination of his inclusion in Smash and the 30 year anniversary of the series for Capcom to wake the fuck up and say, oh shit, one of our biggest properties ever is just rolling around with the dust in the broom closet? Fuck me, I guess. Uh, let's do something about it, maybe. If you play Mega Man, just enjoy the randomness of the gameplay because it's gonna be more consistent than the respect that he gets from his own parent company. Sorry guys, but it's just time to give up. It's just time to give up. I really like Wii Fit Trainer.
In fact, she was my tertiary main for a long time after Snake and Captain Falcon. Her representation of the modern age of Nintendo peripherals, large potential of fitness and motion control based moves, and standing up as the champion of the Wii U felt like a solid choice for a character to represent more than just the game of her origin. And yet she just doesn't even exist. Nobody plays this character. You never see this character online, and as far as I know, there's not a single pro who mains her. Maybe asking for a character based around exercise for the Smash Brothers audience was a matter of completely misunderstanding the target audience. All right, let me tell you something I find hilarious, hysterical, and downright funny. Rosalina is a celestial being honor bound to watch over the entire cosmos. At the same time, she fulfills her motherly instinct by adopting sentient star people floating around throughout the galaxy. She's canonically seven foot three, can fire projectile force fields, levitates, manipulates gravity, and can most most likely teleport in some capacity. And yet, when she uses her recovery move to jettison into the air, all she can muster is a sound reminiscent of that time she finally farted after a two hour long tummy ache. Woo! Rosalina, just on intention, is a good character. If your friendly neighborhood big lady player is of a higher skill bracket than everyone else, then matches will not even be remotely close because of this little five-pointed polygon piss boy right here. Enjoy putting in a lot of work just to get a KO that's not gonna matter. Enjoy being slapped around by a near permanent disjointed hitbox. And most importantly, enjoy having to touch the 24th most cummed on character according to the power rankings at rule 34. .xxx. Side note, I, I think something's going on here. A few years ago, when I made another video on this on similar topic, this list was like what you would expect. It was popular anime and video game characters drawn in a, you know, like a like the the fucking hentai sort of art style, right? But now it's adult cartoon characters drawn in largely plain art styles that don't translate to it i don't think it just seems weird to me you know like like i could see people pleasuring themselves to stan's wife from american dad but eight times as many people did that than to rosalina that's a little fishy Regardless, all of this wraps up in a nice little package because when facing a Rosalina player, you're going to be playing mind games. Kill Luma. Do it. And it's miserable plasma-based life. Because Rosalina player is so perpetually attached to that little dumpy guy, they will spend all of their gameplay and perhaps half their life savings just trying to keep him alive even though he comes back. And when he's gone, it is full-blown panic mode. A full frontal lobe shut down until that respawn timer finally grows graciously allows the game to continue again. You may think a victory over Luma is pointless, but it's a moral victory and shockingly the key to winning the entire game. Oh, and beyond that, Rosalina is hotter than Peach and Daisy and you know it's true and you fucking fight me if you want to see these fucking hands. Who pissed in your cornflakes? You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Yeah, we get it. You're playing a character who effectively can only participate in half of a match. But perhaps the fact that the average Smash player is the same height as Little Mac, but not even remotely the same build, Little Mac players are somehow some of the deepest role players the world has ever seen. In their mind, the world and odds are stacked against them for every single press of the ready to fight button, regardless of how large the skill gap is between them and the fifth graders they just challenged. There's a chip on the shoulder of anyone who locks in Tiny Punching Boy, and every time a haymaker lands, their brain does a quick calculation of whether or not the digital entity that was just hit felt actual pain from that blow. When the answer is calculated as negative, disappointment sets in. You're gonna be the next Hokage. And also the most normal Pokemon fan to play Smash. Isn't it ironic that the Pokemon designed to be a literal vehicle for self-insert fantasies is played by the most well-adjusted of the professional children's game associates? You've got obsessive tryhards, anti-win fun chasers, malicious psychopaths, children, Squirtle, fetish exhibitionists, casuals, fragile furries, and... Well, okay, I'm gonna leave Incineroar for his turn. But you admittedly gotta be a pretty cool guy to play Greninja. You've gotta be a big fan of spamming attacks and mashing buttons until a combo magically appears. But most importantly, you've gotta hate yourself more than any other player because you will be your own enemy for the entire game. Your motto in this game is they can't kill me if I kill me. And your vehicle for record self-destructing is driven by something with a stupid, stupid name. Greninja? Really? It's apparently a combination of ninja, which, yeah, of course, okay, and grenouille, 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 which is French for frog. 
The Kalos region where Greninja comes from is based on France, so there's some form of logic chain operating behind the scenes, but I have to add this rant to the ballooning video runtime because this is where things get really stupid. In the French version of Pokemon, they don't call this guy Greninja. They don't use a name that uses Grenouille, which you would think would make a lot of sense. Greninja's name in France is Amphenobi a combination of Amphibian and Shinobi, and a 4,000 times better name for this feudal frog fencer than Greninja. Somehow, the French version is better than the version made out of French. Wrap your head around that one, and then wrap your organs around your spinal cord from the repeated impact of smacking the bottom of the stage when you play this guy. Wait, 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 Is that Peter Griffin in Smash? Oh my god! That's hilarious! That is without a doubt one of the funniest things I've ever seen. How did you come up with such an original and funny idea? Are you a stand-up comedian? You have to be. You know, you know what you should do? You know what you should do? You should use this guy online and put your name as Peter or P. Griffin or Family Guy without a space in it or something like that. That would be absolutely hysterical. Now, the next thing you're going to tell me, the next thing, the next thing you're going to show me is that you made another one of like Obama or Steve Harvey or some other pop culture character or person, you know, because you're so funny and you're so clever. Now, you at least made it yourself, right? You didn't just copy a design from the Internet, did you? Because that would spoil all of the magic. You know, the magic of your own creativity and wit and humor and, and your really great ideas. Because you're the only person who ever thought of this before. To make this joke, to do, to do this funny thing. And, and it was you who created it. This really, really funny thing you did here. Okay, did you figure out that there's nothing to say about me's yet? They're custom characters. Their, their entire point is to be whatever you want. It's like trying to make fun of what's in your Christmas stocking first thing Christmas morning. How the fuck are you supposed to know what's in there? Although I will, I will. Ser seriously, no bullshit. I will give you true comedian funny points if you use a me to recreate a fighter that's already in the existing game. Because you have Mario in the game, but then if you're playing online and you run into a me that's named Mario and plays exactly the same, that's pretty goddamn funny. Oh man, I fucking hate this bitch. I have written pages upon pages of this document undercutting the idiosyncrasies of Smash Brothers players, but let me tell you the one thing to take away from this video's long runtime. It's one thing I want you to remember above anything else. Palutena is absolutely everything wrong with this video game. Where do we start? A character that no one asked for, taking up a spot reserved for potential gaming giants, with a bland as hell personality, proving passable due to the presence of tits and ass from a previously discussed low-selling series that Sakurai gets dibs on entering because of his grandfathering and superpowers, wrapped up in a high-tier shell, meaning you are going to see this bitch everywhere. No positivity comes from Palutina. Everyone hates playing against her. People only play her due to her effectiveness. She is like an anti-fun vacuum set to maximum suck. Let's not forget if you're a lore nerd or a world building geek, the tonally perfect and functional brawl codec conversations featuring Snake were replaced in Smash 4 by Palutena's Guidance, a flimsy anime cringe dripped fan service yuck pile. Smash Brothers has a remarkably strong track record in making good choices for entrance, but I think Palutena is my absolute first choice for characters that need to be kicked the fuck off the roster. Okay, maybe tied with Byleth and Corrin, but everybody hates Byleth and Corrin. The only defense most people go to is, well, she's got a really good move set, or oh, she's so much fun to play, which is bullshit coming out of a horse's ass. Remember that she was added to Smash 4 as a demo of the character customization system. Her entire higher gimmick was having over 20 moves to choose from, and the version we have in Ultimate today is a gimped up slap job designed to try to make something out of this character into something interesting and memorable. Defending any 
Smash Brothers character with the argument of saying they're fun to play or have good moves is a terrible defense because you can tweak any character to play however you want. Although techniques are lifted from their respective franchises, how they function in the game is up to the developers first and foremost. Let's take my main man Snake as an example. CQC is a huge part of the Metal Gear Solid series, and yet about 95% of the memorable CQC moves from Metal Gear Solid 3, 4, and 5 that would fit perfectly into his moveset are nowhere to be found in Smash. Instead, for the sake of gameplay, he was given a sky-high up kick and a double low kick, which I'm pretty sure never happened in any of the games except maybe sorta? You can create moves that both make sense for the sake of gameplay and are reasonably seen from their respective universe, but never actually occur in the source material for any characters. Examples include Peach pulling out Toad as a shield, Fox is Fox Illusion and Firefox, and nearly everything Pac-Man does. Palutena slotting in as generic magical anime princess who does spells is boring shit that people only defend because of Smash Brothers, not for any true passion for the series or her design. And all of that doesn't even discuss who this slot could have worked better for. If you want a character whose inclusion is designed to showcase a huge variety of moves and customizable characters, the potential is near limitless both in-house and out of it. If we're allowing guest characters, I think Dante, Nero, and Virgil from Devil May Cry would be the absolute perfect encapsulation of this idea. But if we're restricted to Nintendo IPs, then why not add Waluigi as a grab bag of all the Mario spin-off games? He'll throw dice blocks, he'll drive around go-karts, give him the sport smash attacks that Peach has. Or add Paper Mario, because you can do so much shit around the theme of paper. And that's straight from his fucking series. There is obviously also non-Mario IP choices that are good for this idea, but I am completely tired of talking and thinking about anything revolving around Palutena. Let me just conclude with this. I fucking hate this bitch. And you should too. Easily my least favorite character in this game. Oh, you're the weird kid, aren't you? Now put this in the golden letters above the gates of Super Smash Con. No normie shall main Pac-Man. Funny to think that in the year it was released, Pac-Man made over a billion dollars in quarters from arcade machines. The following year, it made over six billion in quarters, which is more money than Vegas casinos and the movie industry made that year combined. These days, what even is Pac-Man anymore? A nostalgia rep? A Namco rep? Whenever someone utters the phrase, oh shit, here comes Pac-Man, what even comes to mind except that Bloodhound Gang song that made that line a cultural reference in the first place? In these off-to-a-great-start 2020s, the vast majority of hardcore gamers just know Pac-Man because he's Pac-Man from the old Pac-Man things, with absolutely no appreciation for the fact that he had a ton of spin-offs, cartoons, and a top fucking 40 song about him called Pac-Man Fever, which means we often observe him just for what he is. And what he is in Smash is a fucking weirdo. He's a sentient yellow ball that summons fire hydrants and fruits. Now there's always the classic unwatchably uncreative YouTube writing at play of other YouTubers that say shit like, well, what if game characters were real? Mario does drugs and Link breaks into people's houses. But I think that middle school tier humor here is justified for Pac-Man because seriously, look at this fucking guy. Tell me this isn't the main pick of theater kids and hipsters. When writing this script, I audibly went, ugh, when I jotted down Robin's name. Do we really, really need three Fire Emblem Awakening reps? I mean, it was a hit seller and Fire Emblem is carried into popularity by its absolutely obsessive fan base, but give me some fucking variety here. I understand that Krom and Lucina are clones of existing characters, but so what? You've got a franchise with about 12 mainline entries by Smash Brothers release, and you can't think of anyone iconic to pull from there? They certainly use them as fan service in the more modern games. How about Hector or Lynn from Fire Emblem 7? Fire Emblem 7 was the first game officially released in America. People who played the original Fire Emblem games like myself would appreciate those characters as a good representation of when the series finally crossed over to the West. Or even better, how about you just don't fucking add as much Fire Emblem at all? Now that's a decision that would make everyone happy. Even Fire Emblem fans. Because for all their magical bullshit, Robin is still technically an anime swordsman. And the roster is stacked with repetition as it is. This is just a pointless choice. I'm really feeling it! Does this appeal to you? 
Well, of course it does. It's me we're talking about. But this is all anyone is ever going to think about when they think about Shulk. Fuck you, Monado Arts. Fuck your obnoxious taunts. Fuck your sword reach. Fuck everything about you. Because to 99% of the player base, Shulk is, oh, the guy who took his fucking shirt off. Now, even though Sephiroth has been added with a ton of bare chest service and Kazuya's default outfit is beach ready, Shulk's already supplanted his soft abs into people's memory banks because when he strips down, it just feels the fuck out of nowhere. Sephiroth is a deep, edgy katana wielder, showing up with his chest exposed by default anyway. Him casting off his Matrix outfit just conveys to the viewer that he's not fucking around anymore, and you're probably gonna have a blade endoscopy. And Kazuya is a scarred up motherfucker, implying years and years of hard battles, punctuated by his ridiculous physique and obvious fighting stance. Shulk's swimsuit outfit is just downright embarrassing to anyone who hasn't played Xenoblade Chronicles. And it's still embarrassing to anyone who has, because haha, <laughs> you just admitted that you played Xenoblade Chronicles. Holy shit, that's embarrassing. I don't particularly care how this blonde bastard plays or any of the 900 reasons to find him annoying. In my eyes, and unfortunately in my dreams, Shulk's defining characteristic is stopping the show to show off his abs. And not knowing how to get the show rolling again because his momentum grinder has only one setting to a halt. Eh, I'm pretty disappointed. Don't get me wrong, if you're a cool kid, you rock the Koopa kids, especially Iggy, the best Koopa, but their implementation itself is pretty lackluster. Yeah, the clown car is an obvious addition, but why not take advantage of the paintbrush from Mario Sunshine? I suppose that's just a Bowser Jr. thing and not really a Koopa Kids thing, but I just don't give a shit. They can use it if they want to. The paintbrush has a monumental level of potential creativity behind it and is quickly becoming just as signature to Bowser Jr. as the clown car. It just feels like there's something missing here, like there's more to be done with this cast. Like a reference or a piece of their creation that's just not there. And that's because a lot of the time I forget they're even in the game. Didn't a lot of them used to use magic wands in their old games or something? I don't know, work some Kamek shit for them. D do something, not just what we got. This is about the part where I break down how I'd take my fat, stinky poopy on anyone who mains Bowser Jr. But I can't even think of how any of them are unique in any way. It just feels like this gaggle of green gangsters has one playstyle you see again and again, no matter who's taking the wheel. And it's pretty easy to stop once you figure it out. They're gonna run to one side, then they're gonna either slam the cart into you or bait you with the cart and try to hit you with a projectile. If you don't commit to anything too hard, then hey, you win the game. It's not even worth talking about these miscreants when there's so much more pressing issues like, why didn't you do anything interesting with them? Oh, fuck off. Fuck off. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. No, 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 no. Don't even say it. Don't even start. Do not even talk. Shut the fuck up. You knew exactly what you were doing. You picked this dog and duck for one potential way to be a piece of shit out of a hundred. You wanted to lock in something annoying or something to troll someone else with or something to stall the game or something brain dead or blah, 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 blah. Unlike Diddy Kong, who at least gets to be super goofy and play off his annoyingness as intentional, Duck Hunt's only mode is annoying, even though it doesn't seem like that was his design. I don't fucking respect you. I really don't. Duck Hunt is a character picked from pure malice and hatred. Nobody, and I mean nobody, plays Duck Hunt just to have a good time. You do it because your game is mental warfare and your guns are loaded with rage bullets. You want me to roast the actual characters? Fine, it's a dog and a duck, the end. The dog laughs at you when you miss shooting at the duck. That right there could be a 50 page long thesis statement on what goes on in the mind of a duck hunt player. There's plenty of annoying characters in Smash Brothers, and if you're smart enough, you can play any character in an annoying fashion. But no one on this list encapsulates pure unfun strategy like duck hunt. Fair warning, if you run duck hunt, you will be branded all right, time to stop fucking around. I respect you again. You saw arguably the most straightforward mainstream fighting game around and said, oh, hey, hang on. What if I made this nearly as complicated as all the other bullshit in this dying genre? There's an extraordinary amount of awe and wonder to a perfectly executed Ken combo. And that, by the way, is a really good Smash competitive joke if you're in the know. And very few things turn up the excitement like Ryu absolutely busting someone in half. I would wager that Ryu and Ken potentially belong in the upper echelons of hype alongside the all-time greats. Except they have a caveat. Don't fuck it up. 
If you're one of the people who puts in the work with these two, I will watch your stream, subscribe to your channel, and fuck your girlfriend. But if you suck or play lame or, oh man, there it goes, there goes your chance at ever making any friends. The bar is set very high for you, young man. So impress us. Unlike unstoppable hype trains like Captain Falcon and Donkey Kong, you have a lot of dumb tools in your belt. You spam projectiles? I'm not watching. You keep repeating just one combo? I'm uninstalling the game. And if I don't see a single parry all game, I'm calling calling your parents and telling on you. To give you a behind the scenes sneak peek at what I do, I don't write these scripts in order. I kind of bounce around an alternation between characters where I immediately know what I want to say and ones where I have to do research and don't really know much about. Cloud is the last character on this list that I'm writing because I, I just can't keep doing this anymore. <laughs> I can't keep making anime jokes. It's stale. It's just too easy. It's really not funny by this point. But it's also not fair. Because Cloud is anime. Cloud is so fucking anime. Cloud is the most anime thing on this list. And now I have to ask, what the hell even is anime anymore? Cloud has over-the-top multi-directional hair, but it's a suitable blonde instead of a whacktastic pink or whatever the dick-loving fuck the protagonist of Fire Emblem and Gage is supposed to be flaunting. He has an entirely impractical sword, but instead of shotgun slamming it like, say, Guts from Berserk, he whips it around at Mach 5 like it's made of paper. Cloud's got on a turtleneck sweater, which is wonderful if it gets a bit drafty, but he has no sleeves, meaning he'll be cold anyway. His Advent Children outfit makes more sense, but that collar is even more fucking stupid, so never mind. At least Cloud has charisma. Final Fantasy to me has always felt like an anime series that pushed itself so hard to be stupid that it stopped giving a shit. When I watch people play Modern Fire Emblem or Persona 5 or Kingdom Hearts, there's at least 30 or 40 points in the game where I laugh and I can't help myself from saying, holy shit, this is stupid. But with Final Fantasy, it all just wraps back around again into, yes, this is stupid stupid, we don't care, in terms of becoming fun again. It doesn't try to pander waifus at you with disgustingly fake writing for lonely fucks to jerk off to. It doesn't make you the coolest guy ever with power fantasies because you have one million friends and somehow are the most charismatic life form possible despite the fact you only speak nine words a year. And it doesn't talk down to you like you're a babbling baby hoping desperately the next year you'll be allowed to use the big boy potty. By the way, those last three lines are for the three respective series, Fire Emblem, Persona, and Kingdom Hearts just mentioned, but we are getting to Joker and Sora, don't you worry. Let me just put it this way. If anime is a nonsensical nihilistic art of throwing whatever the fuck you want at the wall and trying to make it impactful, Final Fantasy is the series that does all that, and then when people laugh at it, it laughs back and says, fuck yeah, this looks like shit, and that's what I wanted. I love this. To all you cloud players out there, I'm going to tip my imaginary virgin fedora, an accessory many of you probably have in kind, because you could have chosen much worse. This is not a bit. I am going to need someone to seriously try their hardest to defend Corrin in the comments. Because I can't think of a single positive thing about this character. Anime character. Fire Emblem. Foot Fetishist. Scaly. Incest Supporter. Mid-tier. The list goes on and on and on, but with Corrin, I am drawing a complete and utter blank defending them. What hurts me the most of all is you would think a character who can transform into a huge ferocious dragon would be more... anything. More interesting, more unique, more excitingly designed? Nope. Just blatant anime fan service character, boring player fantasy insert bullshit. Woo. Corrin just absolutely sucks. I, I don't even have to figure out a way to put my feelings into words here because even the Fire Emblem community knows that Corrin absolutely sucks. Because there's tons of threads on this exact fact and literal threads on how to avoid incest when playing Fire Emblem Fates because of how wonky the writing in that game is. We've been down a long road, but I just don't even give a shit about Corrin. Every single character on this list has some spark in my brain that says I should say something. Positive negative, a witty observation, a dead joke, it doesn't matter. I'm compelled to say something. But with Corrin, all I can think is, it would be better if you just didn't exist.
And I struggle to think of anyone who would disagree with that. Hey, thanks for ruining Smash 4. I really appreciate that. What I appreciate more is watching your proximal interflangicles snap in half from all those combos you've been having to do. Key phrase in that sentence is have to do, by the way, because playing Bayonetta without learning combos is a masterful stand-up comedy act. We're all going to laugh at you. Something I find amusing, whether intentional or not, is how little Bayonetta seems to be sexualized in the context of Smash Brothers. If you do hours of sticky keyboard Googling like I do, you'll find plenty of thematic artwork involving Peach, Samus, Palutena, Daisy, etc. But Bayonetta's count is shockingly low for a character who comes from a game where you literally strip to perform attacks and have camera angles that look like this. What you then have is Bayonetta being the most antithetical Smash character in history. Smash is straightforward, relatively simple fighting game, while Bayonetta doesn't even work if you don't have an understanding of more advanced mechanics. And while Smash Brothers shows off the squeaky clean Nintendo trademarked image, going so far as to even tone down Snake's butt cheeks, God rest their soul, Bayonetta takes every single frame of the 60 FPS to display some part of her anatomy. Bayonetta is a testament to fuck it, we'll do it the hard way, and an infinite spring well for psychological studies on people who intentionally make things difficult for themselves. A true king's choice for a high-class masochist. Consider her like a motorcycle. Extremely fun to ride, but you better know what the fuck you're doing if you get up to speed. What's up, kids? If your pastime includes mixing Adderall with Monster Energy Drink and fantasizing about elaborate ways to get back at your employer, then Inkling is the perfect character for you. Inkling players always think they're better than they are, and they don't realize just spamming the roller attack isn't a viable strategy, or just painting the ground in Splatoon isn't a very high skill requirement. This is because Inkling players are pure unbacked bravado. They'll flaunt left and right about their huge Twitter likes or how cute their dog is, but behind the curtain is a mess of unpaid parking tickets, dirty laundry on the floor of their room, and self-esteem made of glass. I think it's a symptom of Splatoon players thinking that they're in some sort of cult. That game just breeds elitism and an us-against-them mentality because they falsely believe they're playing some sort of unsung hero of Nintendo's dark underbelly. Newsflash, kiddos, Splatoon is stupidly popular, and as someone who reached the rank of dog queen in Splatoon 1, I'd stomp your shit in half. Whenever you play someone playing Inkling, be nice to them. Maybe even give them a non-sarcastic clap after they win a match, because God knows they need it. Let's laser focus on the big purple dinosaur for a minute. Ridley is a platinum member along with Bowser Jr., King K. Rool, Diddy Kong Wario, and either Animal Crossing rep in the league of characters you could argue should have been in Smash long before they got added. But what makes it extra funny for Ridley is the seemingly childish excuses that prevented him from getting in despite 20 years of fans asking. Ridley was said to be too big to be in Smash Brothers. So big, there's a know your meme page on the subject. Well, I guess the developers think Kazi is built like a tank, Terry is tucking muscles under his hat, and Wario is so fat as fat fuck ass because all three of them weigh more than Ridley, despite Ridley being like 15 feet tall in the Metroid games. Which is how we get the never-ending clown car of comedy that Ridley radiates around him. Ridley is such a strange product of the specific hype generated by Smash character reveals that him standing up in a taunt is cause for celebration. Ridley's pretty low tier, and sees really small amounts of high level play, but if you talk to a Ridley main, they just wipe the sweat from their brow and say, thank god he made it in. Ridley mains would make fantastic monks or homeless people, because they will always be thankful. There could be a cataclysmic shift in the Smash ecosystem, launching game mechanics out the window and transferring actual electric shocks through controllers, and Ridley mains would just mutter, oh, he's still in the game, oh, bless, blessed lord Jesus Christ who art in heaven, he's in the game. If you think kids these days are distracted, Distracted with their AirPods and their TikToks and their phones and their Jollywags. Try having a functional conversation with a Ridley player. Are they about to have a baby while their mother's sick in the hospital? It doesn't matter. The conversation is going to be permanently locked on. Dude, I am so grateful they added Ridley to Smash Brothers. Good for them, really. They can realistically ride this high for about the next five years. Until the next Smash Brothers game comes out, because they've already said they're not keeping all the characters in the next one, and you know for a fact that Ridley's gonna get cut, which will start this silly shit cycle all over again. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to wear Velcro shoes at age 35. Simon and Richter players are the type to pour their cereal in after their milk.
Simon and Richter players are the type of people to butter the bottom side of their bread. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to hide their knees in their shirt when watching a movie. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to refuse to poop in a public bathroom. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to say thanks, you too, when the waiter says enjoy your meal. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to lose just one of their AirPods and never find it. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to leave the plastic film on their electronics to keep them clean. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to microwave leftover pizza. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to correct other people's grammar. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to chew with their mouths open. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to check their phone mid-conversation with someone. Simon and Richter players are the type of people to give an awesome series like Castlevania a bad name by doing the lamest shit on the planet. All right, let me tell you something about this big chunky crocodile whenever I see him. When I was a little kid, I played Donkey Kong Country and this guy was a real jerk. I'd play through the video game and I'd run around as the big funny strong monkey and the tiny silly fast monkey. And he was really hard to beat, but I persevered and I managed to figure it out. And then he came to Smash Brothers, and now, like, sometimes people will beat me with this guy, even though he's allegedly not very good. But I do like playing with him, but he... I don't know how good he is. I'm not very skilled in the world of tectonic plate movements, which is the slang that the Smash players use when describing upper-level play. That's probably not true, but again, I'm not skilled at Smash Brothers enough to know. But then in the second game, duh, duh, fuck, I played Diddy Dixie Kong, who should be in Smash, and fought against King K. Rool, and King K. Rool is like a mad scientist, and it was weird. But then in the third game, you only know how to use the fishing pole attack, and that's it, and you spam it all game because you think it's super cool, because you're equally shitty friends don't know how to avoid it, and you don't even really want to play Smash Brothers, because it's not your kind of game, but all your friends want to play it, and they invited you to play it, and you'd feel kind of weird saying no, and you don't really care, and you just want to have fun with everyone and you know you will without a doubt be the first person to lose every single game and if you ever win a match it's going to be seen as a shocking surprise and everyone's going to reward you with applause and say you're really good at the game but they're just trying to have sex with you Many people were up in arms at the inclusion of Incineroar. They saw him as a waste of a slot, a poor character choice, and not strong enough to pull his worth in amongst the coveted Smash Elite. And I've got to tell you you are so goddamn wrong, it hurts me. Let's look at the facts and pull the same rabbit out of the hat that I, for some reason, have to unearth every handful of videos. Pokemon is the highest grossing franchise of all time and through extrapolation, the most popular franchise of all time. The series with the most representation in Smash is Super Mario at nine characters, which is totally fine. Mario is the flagship Nintendo icon. Give him all the prominence he wants. But in second place is a tie between Pokemon, understandably so, and Fire Emblem. Now, technically, Pokemon has 10 reps if you expand Pokemon Trainer to include Squirtle, Ivysaur, and Charizard as their own entities, but in terms of roster of playable characters, it's a tie. But then things get even messier if you consider Robin, Corrin, and Byleth all have female versions, which are, like, sort of their own character. It, it does not matter. There is a tie. For the sake of this argument, it's a tie. If Nintendo decided to take all the Fire Emblem characters who are from a series which has not even grossed one one hundredth of what Pokemon has, and then they replace three of the Fire Emblem characters with Pokemon, everyone would agree this is a fantastic idea. And it's not even based on popularity. It's because the potential for Pokemon is so much higher. There are currently 1,000 Pokemon and counting, give or take. And you better fucking believe the vast majority of them aren't just anime swordsmen like a certain other franchise in this debate. Taking your pick of that litter is a smart game design choice without even a specific one in mind. Look at Pokemon Tournament, a Pokemon-only fighting game. There's a lot of easy acid flips you could pull from there and just cram into the game. Now let's look at who they did end up selecting throughout the years. Pikachu is the mascot of the company, obviously, and Pichu's an easy in for being a clone. Jigglypuff gets a free pass because he was originally a clone of Kirby to work with the hardware limitations of the N64, and Jigglypuff's also pretty popular in its own right. Mewtwo is one of the most iconic Pokemon ever made and has a huge roster of moves to work with. Whether or not the animators, gameplay designers lived up to that potential, eh, but that's a conversation we already had. 
Pokemon Trainers 3 Pokemon represent the original starters, which is a big money decision. Lucario is extremely popular, hits the furry community in their wallets, and has a lot of potential for moves, and Greninja got pushed hard as fuck by the anime, and also gives us a ninja for the game, which I am perfectly okay with, because ninjas are fucking rad, and if you disagree, you're dumb, and the fact there's only two of them in the game is super stupid. So when it came time to add another Pokemon rep, what did we get? An evil professional wrestler. Let me say that again. A heel turned, dirty, low down, no good, cheating, ego stuffing, professional fucking heavyweight champion of the world wrestler. And he's also a big dumb cat which means his haters are just afraid of getting pussy, and brother, that ain't me. Every single successful fighting game ever made is improved a hundred times over with a pro wrestling character. Zangief, Mike Hagar, King, Armor King, Tina Armstrong, DMX, Method Man, Ghostface Killa. Okay, those last three don't really count. If there's a synapse in your mind palace that fires off a single utterance of rejection towards Incineroar's inclusion, you have absolutely no taste and should feel bad about your opinions. I'm happier that this guy made it in the game than fucking Sora from Kingdom Hearts. That's how perfect of a choice I think he was gameplay-wise. And this takes any and all of my personal bias out of the equation. There were a lot of series to potentially gift us with pro wrestler characters, but to deliver one to us with such a great personality that fits his moveset, the game, and his design? Look at his fucking flaming championship belt for god's sakes, this is a god tier pick. Which gives me no pleasure when I finally bring it home by mentioning that if you're an Incineroar main, you'd probably be a Lucario or Wolf main if you weren't such a submissive bottom. What? Huh? I mean, I guess? Sure, but really? Really? I mean, he's famous, but it's, but it's Piranha Plant. I don't, I, uh, why? Is this a, is he a bad choice? I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's him, all right. But I, I'm just fucking dumbfounded by this one. I don't know if I'm upset, pleased, nonplussed, anything. I, I'm just confused. What the fuck do you even say about Piranha Plant? It'd be the same as if they added Boo, Chain Chomp, Thwomp, Womp, bob um, or Charging Motherfucking Chuck. It's like... I don't have a good argument for why it's a bad idea. Like, everyone knows Mario, and he's the face of Nintendo. But... but why? <laughs> sure... Persona 5 is about 30 hours of good gameplay wrapped up in an overly inflated, drawn-out 100-hour package. And that perfectly describes Joker in Super Smash Bros. If you main Joker and aren't a pro, then you probably don't main Joker. You main Arsene. And if your whole skill level revolves around waiting for him to show up to save the day while bitching about how his broken ass keeps getting nerfs and oh, base form Joker's totally worthless, then why don't you go ahead and go back to your friendship simulator game that has a bunch of people in it who say dialogue that no real human being on earth would ever utter. In the wise words of that cat that everyone wants to have sex with, let's go to sleep, because it's a pretty safe bet to ignore anything and everything a Joker player has to say unless they have some tournament placements to their name. Their advice means nothing, and their perspective is fucked, because there's just something so boring about being the representation of pure anime cringe crossed with tear whoring for wins. Wake me up when your opinion in this game matters because I've got a lottery to play. Oh, and speaking of lotteries, you know that sound when you're playing Mario Kart and you run over an item block. That's what plays on loop in my mind whenever I play Hero. We're all here for our slot machines, our gambling fix. You open that RPG menu and you use all of your magic on it or you get the fuck out. Hero is in the game for the sole purpose of giving me a game to play with my grandson, who just dragged me away from my hot streak at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino's premier video poker machines. There may or may not be an entire character who exists outside of this four spell choice system, but I've never seen it, because it doesn't matter. 
Spin to win is the name of the game, and it's the only compelling reason here to pick not Goku. Just know that if you win, it's because of bullshit. And if you lose, it's absolutely deserved because of your bullshit. Enjoy the final appearance of Bando and Kazooie, everyone. Isn't it shocking criticism of the games industry when for a lot of characters, these two included, Smash is a more accurate portrayal of who they are compared to their main series? But don't blame these two. Blame Rare because they don't know what the fuck to do with them. Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts was a very divisive game, with most people settling on it after all these years as, it's not a bad game, it's just a terrible Banjo-Kazooie game. But the impact it left on Rare never faded from memory. Take a look at the timeline after Nuts and Bolts was released. Over 10 years of remakes, Connect, Garbage, and Sea of Thieves. Now, I like Sea of Thieves. I've got plenty of hours of my own in it, and it's a good romp and fun time. But is it remotely as memorable or impactful as Banjo-Kazooie, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Killer Instinct, or the original Donkey Kong Country trilogy? Rare! You made Donkey Kong Country 2 the best game ever made! You guys can't do something truly great again? Maybe I'm missing something here. Let me know if I'm wrong in any of this, but it's pretty ironic that their current frontline trooper is Sea of Thieves because Microsoft robbed them of their creativity and their ship is sinking. Terry's really cool. Shut the fuck up about Terry. Yeah, that's about all I have to say. Ah, yes, Min Min, everyone's favorite character. It's a character less popular than the sandbag you smack around in home run contest. People hate this bitch, and you can't deny it. Her zone-only, brain-off gameplay style is a mighty way to piss someone off. But I think an arms rep is actually a really good choice. While it easily falls into category of the character acting as an advertisement for the game, it's a game built on an interesting mechanic that perfectly fits the Nintendo Switch, and I think the devs could have easily found a way to balance it out and make it fun. But the question here, though, is why Min Min? In Sakurai's presentation for Min Min, he said that ARMS doesn't really have a protagonist, and the producer of the game personally asked him to use Min Min as the fighter of choice. Huh. Is she really the best choice compared to the rest of the possibilities? I mean, we have to keep the choice unique so that it helps sell the fighter pass. Springman and Ribbon Girl, the characters featured in the ARMS reveal trailer, are currently out. They're pretty similar to Terry and Pyra and Mithra. We could have gone with Lola Pop, who from my research on the game seems to be the most popular character in the ARMS community. Her signature even helps remind you of her rockin' tits, and there's no other clowns in the roster as far as I know, well, except for Byleth. It's a slam dunk idea. Or how about Twintel? She's a famous movie star who uses her hair to attack. Lots of interesting and fun ideas with that one. Look at Cerebella from Skullgirls for a good example. Oh, oh, and, and Helix. Helix would be a good fit. He's a big wiggly jelly monster made in a laboratory. That's super unique. But they went with Min Min. A ramen shop owner who has noodle hair, martial arts skills, and dragon arms. That's just so interesting. Sakurai was told specifically by one of the insider reps at Nintendo Entertainment Planning and Developing Division that they should use Min Min. Maybe they were trying to capture a certain market. A market of consumers that tends to have a pretty big sway on mass media success in the modern globalized world. Okay, now this is, this is absolutely me stereotyping here, but... Maybe a country whose market is just like Japan in a lot of these ways. They tend to utilize Asian cultural items like ramen, martial arts, and dragons. A country, hang on, a country that has already overtaken the Steam user base as the most popular country on there. And, and is quickly oversweeping the entire video game market. Who could that be? Oh, Canada. Oh boy, here we go. Here we 
fucking go. Minecraft is back again to topple the video game industry one more time. Minecraft is the highest selling video game of all time, and it's not even close. It outsells second place, Grand Theft Auto V, by over 50 million units. So how funny is it that Minecraft asserted dominance on Smash Brothers the instant it showed up on the scene? Steve is the talk of the town in the Smash community right now, and he's firmly in the topest of tiers, if not the best character in the game. And this is a character technically played more by your seven-year-old cousin than by you. Steve currently has a glitch being developed right now, putting serious weight on him getting banned from tournaments for being too good, while also being a character that generates more YouTube videos than everyone else featured in this game combined. Steve's gameplay is lame, encourages solitaire playstyles, has options to do anything, and allows you to literally build an L and take a screenshot of it while beating someone's ass. You can scan Smash Brothers forums and subreddits for hours and find equal threads of players calling for Steve to be run out of town and Steve players being sent death threats just for playing the character. And all of this for a blocky dude who makes more money selling merch than some entire franchises represented in Smash. The irony here is beyond delicious. It's scrumptious, decadent, and dare I say yummy. If any character deserves everything he brought to the table, most importantly, the hatred, it's Steve. Oh, you don't fuck with Sephiroth. In terms of milking the sloshy dreams of every bright-eyed PlayStation 1 user or Japanophile, he checks off every box for cool character. Uses a katana, dresses in all black, has long flowing yet still pointy anime-styled hair, is designed around iconography from Christianity, has a huge over-the-top memorable theme song, transforms into an incomprehensible full god, and the list goes on. But something cool about Sephiroth they never mention is his hollow bones because he's a bird. Why wouldn't he be a bird? He flies around, has a wing, and weighs next to nothing. The following characters are heavier than Sephiroth in Smash Brothers. Shulk, Pit and Dark Pit, Pac-Man, Ness and Lucas, Villager, Diddy Kong, Olimar, Sora, and Kirby. A grown-ass man with a ribbling eight-pack and a sword the size of my penis weighs less than some children, a monkey, a child who floats, and a living balloon. While I was a bit bummed Sephiroth came in when we already had a Final Fantasy rep, I really can't be too upset. He's an absolutely standout character from a massive franchise, and is so actually cool that even anime haters like him. I just wish the rest of the guys would stop calling him a bird. Sephiroth does so much work at Patty's Pub, he really deserves more respect. I mean, nicknaming him Sweet Seph? Really? That's stupid. Oh hey, look! It's the Zelda and Sheik transformation gimmick, except this time it's on the most generic character design ever possible, an anime swordswoman. But, but even worse, anime swordswomen that are just blatant advertisements to buy their game. Tell me, anyone out there watching at home, did you want Pyra and Mithra in this game? Did you really, out of anyone you could have had otherwise? Because chances are you didn't. Chances are your reaction to their reveal was, who the fuck are these two? Because as it turns out, as of their release in Smash Brothers Ultimate, Pyra and Mithra were only in one video game, Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Are your stupid shit alarms sounding already? We already have a Xenoblade Chronicles rep in the form of Shirtless Boy, and every other character in the DLC bracket is either from a newly introduced series, an absolute icon in video gaming, or is Fire Emblem. And yeah, Fire Emblem is terrible, but we've already talked about that. The problem with these two isn't just that they're uninteresting, bland, overly specific, forgettable, a recycled gimmick, embarrassing, and pure anime chaff. The problem is that they happen to be the final death nail in the coffin for good entrance. There's only two Smash characters left on this list, and thank God for my voice. Kazuya and Sora. Now, both of those two absolutely deserve to be in Smash, with Tekken being a massive, long-running franchise of easy source material to pull from that perfectly complements the Street Fighter and King of Fighters reps, and Kingdom Hearts having the largest crossover fan base of anime dweebs, dribbling children, and my hobbies are my personality gamers, which is the perfect demographic for Smash. 
And, and also Sora was the most requested character of all time from all the polls, whatever. So to close out my well-deserved shit talk on these two, I'm just gonna list who we could have had instead of these walking billboards for a game that will make most people watching this say, wait a minute, wait, 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 they made a, they made a sequel to Xenoblade Chronicles? You mean they're not from the first game? We're gonna start with Nintendo-owned characters, which means that these characters would have had zero issues in being added to the game. If any of these reminders make you angry, blame Pyra and Mithra. <clears throat> Waluigi, Gino, Paper Mario, Bandana Waddle Dee, Dixie Kong, Skull Kid, any Rhythm Heaven character, Ring Fit Trainee, and as previously discussed, like half of every Pokemon ever made. As for third parties, Crash Bandicoot, Ratchet and Clank, Spyro, Dante, Virgil, or Nero from Devil May Cry, the Doom Slayer or old school Doom guy, Rayman, Isaac from Golden Sun, Shantae, Shovel Knight, Hollow Knight, Monster Hunter, literally anyone from Guilty Gear, pretty much anyone from Resident Evil, and any of the well-known characters from Mortal Kombat. Majima from Like a Dragon. Now, side note, the creator of the series said he doesn't want Kiryu in Smash because he doesn't like the idea of Kiryu beating up women. But he never said anything about Majima, and if you know the series, that would absolutely be in character. Lloyd from the Tales series. 2B. Phoenix Wright. And about a hundred other characters from series that were already added that aren't fucking Pyra and Mithra. And finally, Agumon and Master Chief, but let's be honest, for those two, that would never, ever, ever happen. Like, I would rather that they reveal that those two are never getting in than they reveal that Pyra and Mithra did get in. So, uh, yeah, fuck these guys. Hating on someone whose mission is to just beat ass is difficult, but not an impossible goal. And that's because this guy is just a wee bit too strong. So a lot of the flex doesn't come from his sick, Pythons. It's just getting one lucky hit mid ass beating. Watching a master Kazuya at work is like a world renowned glassblower putting together a piece. It's a delicate but volatile art cascading into something utterly fragile but pristine. But that only applies to a small, small subset of the population. The rest of you suck absolute ass and rely on pure raw luck damage to carry your ass out of bad spots. Remember when Ganondorf was all manufactured hype? Well, imagine Ganondorf except you give him all the tools to actually get in and bust some nuts. And then you gave him even more tools because you were having a closeout sale on really good shit. Now that's a much more interesting thing, isn't it? But it's also where heavy privilege now starts to come in. If you're unfamiliar with Smash Brothers and fighting games in general, heavy privilege isn't just a system to divide who eats the most fried chicken at Golden Corral. Heavy privilege dictates that because a heavy character has a harder time approaching their opponent, moving around the stage, and playing the neutral game, they deserve to hit harder. Kazuya hits like six trucks having sex with a Mini Cooper, but he's also got armor on his moves, and stuns, and all sorts of safe attacks, and movement options, and you fucking name it. Kazuya is a heavy sandwich made from the best cuts of meat from all the fat boys, and it shows. I'm quite proud of you for choosing a character who has one strategy of, come here boy, I'm gonna whoop them cheeks. But you're also absolutely dead last on the totem pole of characters that worked for their kill. Get the job done, but don't feel proud about it, you scummy shithouse. I'm gonna give you the full honest truth on this one. <laughs> and if you're a Kingdom Hearts fan, <laughs> stick with me. You're not gonna like it, but the adults are talking, which means it's gonna work out okay. I fucking hate Kingdom Hearts. I can't stand it. I really, truly cannot stand it. It is a series that from top to bottom feels like it has been made for seven-year-olds, but is enjoyed by the worst kind of teenagers and the lowest self-esteemed adults. I have played many, many video games in my life. But no collection of games has made me cringe more than Kingdom Hearts. There's no exaggeration. I'm not making a bit. It takes a lot to embarrass me. Did you see me with my shirt off earlier? That's a good idea. But in my combination of personal playthroughs and gameplay viewings of Kingdom Hearts, I struggle 
to think of a series where I would quicker cover my monitor if my parents walked in. And I regularly play hentai games. The gameplay is overrated. The dialogue is abysmal. The usage of the source material is mostly okay, but often an uninspired retelling of the original plots. The overarching story is a confusing mess. The drama is convoluted. The music is... It's pretty good, I can't lie. And most importantly, if Kingdom Hearts was a standalone series and didn't include Disney, nobody would give a fuck about it. It's probably the strongest criticism of Sora specifically. The original characters of Kingdom Hearts are lame, and if they existed in any other series, they wouldn't continue to exist to this day. Don't believe me? Go look up Sora's first appearance in the Square Enix game, The Bouncer. But, but, Sora is the best rep we could have possibly had added to Smash Brothers. Hands down. You cannot disagree with this. The fervor for this series is life altering. And the fact it represents a successful negotiation with Disney is the most inspiring thing I have ever seen come out of 2022. I'm putting aside my differences for this one. I know I'm going to get a lot of hate for my opinions on Kingdom Hearts, and I truly don't care. Because unlike Kingdom Hearts fans, I've experienced a vagina that wasn't on the internet or my own. But I applaud your victory. I will celebrate with you hand in hand that Sora is in this game, because I struggle to think of anyone who would make a better final bow on this gift package of characters. I have a lot of choices I would have loved to have made it in the game that didn't. I'm fairly still upset that no one from Devil May Cry got in there because I think they're literally a perfect choice. Ichiban from the newest Like a Dragon game came in a little late, but I think he still had a shot to be slotted in the game. There was a window of time, and I think Raiden from Metal Gear, specifically the Rising Revengeance version, would have been an absolutely fantastic and just as impactful choice as a lot of other characters. But I could rattle off a hundred names, a thousand names of characters I'd want in the game, from reasonable choices to absurd obscure never gonna happens, and none of them would be a better choice than Sora. Congratulations, Kingdom Hearts fans. You finally, finally got a victory in life. A victory in the form of a floaty, annoying child whose excitement generation just compounds how much you spend way too much time on the worst parts of social media, but a victory nonetheless. And finally, I've moved to the center stage because there's one last character I haven't mentioned. A lot of you out there are probably audibly gasping and whispering, oh, but he talked about all 82 fighters. Who else could it possibly be? Well, as someone who operates nine levels above the common man, let me handle this. But first, I didn't handle this video alone. I just did 99.9% .9 of the writing. I want to give a hearty thank you and meaty, slightly damp handshake to Goblin, Moki, and Light of the Moist Esports Smash team for helping me with some of the scripting for this video. They provided me with a handful of insight on these characters in the competitive side of Smash that I wouldn't have otherwise realized, and they helped make sure that each and every verbal smackdown I went through here tonight was entirely factually accurate. Let me put it this way. Do you disagree with anything I said in this video? Well, I've got a team of professionals on my side, so suck my fucking dick. And now, the final character. Picking a totally random character means one of two things. The first is that you just came here to play. You enjoy the activity of playing a game with your friends enough that you couldn't give less of a shit if you win or lose. In a game with 40 different franchises represented by the playable characters, and way more in cameos, you circumvent even choosing just one. When even the simplest explanation of your choice comes from, oh, it's a game I played in the past. Instead, you aim to spin the wheel and find out what'll happen, and then you just roll with it. Good on you! You got charisma checked while playing a social video game, and you passed with flying colors. But the second option is that you're teaching someone a lesson. Random select is often whipped out when things are one-sided. Are you shitting on someone so hard that they have to tell the tournament organizer that they want to cancel their pre-registration for next year? Well, drive the point in further by suggesting they should have been aborted by whooping their ass with literally anybody. 
The random button represents two sides of the same unwashed gamer coin. Some people play Smash like every other game in their life. They'll crack into it every now and then, but if something else is better grabbing their attention, well, it's time to move on and hold out for when the gang decides they just want to pop some stocks in Smash Bros. And then there are others who consider the game a never-ending ladder climb. A digital chessboard where any and all ineffective options must be eliminated. But whoever you choose says a lot about who you are. And there's always internal debates on striking the balance of your choice between the desire to win and the desire to pick your favorite. But no matter who you pick, there's a very important lesson to be learned from reflecting on all this. This is a children's video game, dude. <laughs> Relax. Look, look, here's, here's the box art. I'll put it right here. It says E10 on the box. See? Made for children. Children 10 and older. Ask your parents' permission if you're nine or younger. There's probably plenty of nine-year-olds, eight-year-olds who parents wouldn't give shit. This is a children's video game for kids. For small kids. Alright, so anyway, here's a tier list I made rating your choice of main from one to five. It's not based on, like, tiers or anything. It's purely based on what I consider to be the excitement factor when you choose that character. How much people like to watch you play, how much people like that you play that character. It's popularity in terms of, you know, how, how much people like your character. But even then, it's just my fucking opinion. I don't care. I have to leave now. My throat hurts. Goodbye!